Hello, um, let me introduce myself to begin with. I'm Sophie Robin Olivier. I'm a professor at the Sorbonne School of Law at the University of Paris 1. And uh, I will talk about uh, the EU directives on precarious work. And the question, what are the loopholes in these directives? The first question I'm asking, and I think this is a very classical one in the context of this webinar, what is precarious work? It is work, one can say, without a standard employment contract. It is the kind of work that is described uh, sometimes as a typical, a typical employment, or sometimes as flexible working arrangements, non-standards, or contingent or precarious contracts. This is a situation where uh, the basic idea is that workers are not protected as uh, they are in so-called normal work contracts or ordinary or standard work contracts because uh, either the contract is a very short-term contract or they work only for a certain number of hours, not full-time, or it is very easy to um, dismiss the workers within these work arrangements because um, termination of the contract is made easy. Uh, what has been observed in recent times is that there has been a considerable increase uh, of these types of contracts, these non-standard employment contracts. Uh, and that, some authors said, including uh, uh, Catherine Stone and Harry Hathers, uh, that is a very serious uh, threat to labor market regulation and mostly to uh, workers' protection. And this is true around the world. This is not true only on some particular countries. This has been observed basically everywhere. So hence this project, this webinar on precarious work. Um, one can add that uh, this situation is, um, has been made worse probably by the effect of so-called digitalization of work. So uh, sometimes it is also described as the gig economy. Uh, so all kinds of evolutions uh, related with uh, uh, new technologies that uh, concern in particular the development of platform, platform workers. Uh, those very precarious workers that we've seen uh, emerging in, in recent times and uh, that are particularly in need uh, of protection. So precarious work uh, has been a problem in the last decades. It's not something recent, uh, something that appeared in very recent times, but one can say that it has become uh, even worse probably with digitalization uh, because it's not only part-time work or fixed term contracts, which could be decent in a way, um, because you know it can be fixed term, but it can be for a couple of months or even a couple of years. Or it can be part-time where workers work half-time, and that still maintains a, a, a decent uh, a decent living. But when it becomes very, very short terms, few hours contract with um, according remunerations, that is to say very low remunerations, um, that becomes more critical, more problematic. So that's what we are seeing. And we've seen an evolution in the last period that uh, is sometime, sometimes called flexibilization of work. So here we are with the situation. And uh, to face the situation uh, in the in the last decades, and I must say it's been uh, a while since EU law was concerned, uh, EU legislation developed. Uh, EU legislation concerning a typical work was thought about uh, already in the 70s, probably even slightly before that, uh, just after the, um, the economic crisis that um, Europe had to face. Uh, in the late 60s already. So um, the origins of the EU intervention in this field is, is, is quite ancient, uh, but it took time. 
uh, to uh, actually adopt directives in this field. Uh, the three directives that were adopted um, in the first in the first place, the first uh, I'm not going to say the first generation because in fact there are two of one generation, one of a second generation, I should say, and then we have the, the most recent one. Um, so the three directives that were adopted and, and we've, we've been living with for a while uh, are the directive of 97, um, following the framework agreement of social partners on part-time work. So that's the first moment, uh, this agreement of social partners on, on part-time work uh, protection of part-time workers uh, that led to the directive of 97. So see, we are already in 97, although the, um, the first IDs came up in the 70s. Second directive, again, on the basis of an agreement between social partners was adopted in 99 and it's about fixed term work. And the last one is the directive of 2008. Uh, and that is a directive that was adopted um, classically by, by um, by the institutions of the European Union, the Parliament and the Council, not by social partners, not following uh, an agreement between social partners because uh, social partners did not manage to find an agreement on uh, temporary agency work. So we've been uh, living with these three directives um, which um, show that um, EU law has, has uh, started with a, a segmented approach of precarious work, um, addressing the situation of some uh, atypical contracts and some atypical workers, um, you know, the, the part-time workers, the um, fixed term contracts, and then temporary agency workers, uh, each being uh, dealt with with a, a separated piece of legislation. And that, uh, left outside of the regulation, a number of contracts, precarious work contracts, uh, including the very short work contracts, uh, employment for very few hours, uh, or uh, even further outside the field of application of these uh, directives, uh, the development of self-employment uh, or the flexibilization of standard employment contracts um, namely through the facilitation of termination, uh, an evolution that, that, that we've seen coming, uh, coming up and developing, including through recently through, through platform work. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we've seen so sorts of, uh, or new types of flexibilization through um, um, self-employment, uh, which is a work arrangement, which is, uh, particularly flexible in general, or through this, uh, this uh, facilitation of termination of some specific contracts. And that is not covered by uh, directives. Uh, none of the directives uh, are covering these situations. So there were loopholes um, already in the development of this legislation regulating a typical work from the beginning to, to address situations one by one, category by category, uh, left um, spaces in between. Uh, so it's not, it's not covering all types of uh, precarious workers. Um, so that's the situation. And uh, very recently, well, that was the situation until very recently there was an evolution with the directive of 2019 Directive 2019-1152, adopted in June 2019. The directive is on transparent and predictable working conditions in the European Union. Uh, when you read the title, uh, it's not necessarily obvious to everyone that it's about precarious work, but that is, that is the case. Uh, the objective of the directive is clearly to address precarious situations related namely uh, to the emergence of um, uh, digitalization and uh, more generally the, the idea of uh, um, the, um, the increase, the increased flexibilization of employment relation uh, with the, the very extreme forms of flexibilization uh, which uh, needed to be addressed. So that's what the directive of 2019 
intense uh, to, um, to deal with this situation of increased precarious situation. So the directive covers indeed very short uh, work contracts and it does include and treats uh, in particular with specific provisions, work on demand and zero hour contracts. So that's to create innovation uh, of the last um, period. Now this contribution is looking at, is looking at uh, the uh, scope of EU legislation on precarious workers, but it's looking at this scope of um, uh, protection uh, through the, I should say, maybe the, the, the negative uh, angle. It's looking at uh, not um, essentially the, the achievements that are quite, uh, quite impressive, especially in the last, uh, the last directive. Um, but really what we try to show here is uh, what is missing. So the, the limitation, and uh, in particular, the limitation of the scope of protection that is granted by the, uh, by the, the directives, by EU legislation. So that's going to be the focus. And to do that, we will look at um, four different aspects. We will uh, start with um, this, this uh, very striking element, which is the absence of uh, an autonomous definition of the notion of worker at EU level. And that's, that's one of the problematic aspects of the uh, of European regulation. Second, we will look at the limited uh, scope of the protection granted by EU legislation. And by that, I mean the three directives on part-time fixed term uh, contracts and on uh, temporary agency work. And then we will look at the specific evolutions deriving from directive uh, 2019 1152 And lastly, some, some ideas uh, on possible developments in the future. So we'll look at the perspectives more rapidly. So let's start with the absence of an autonomous definition of the notion of worker. That is something very, uh, very important to, to have in mind when considering EU legislation on precarious work. Because uh, workers uh, in this, this directive, the four of them in fact, um, are, workers are not defined, uh, the workers who are covered, the precarious workers, they are not defined uh, at EU level. Uh, in particular, if you look at the three directives that were adopted in 97, 99 and 2008, um, they um, rely on national legislation to define the notion of workers or the notion of employment contracts. So you see that uh, in a close to one of the agreement in part-time work, for instance, and similarly on the same, in the same clause of uh, the agreement in fixed term contracts, uh, they, they mentioned that the agreement applies to, to workers who have an employment contract or employment relationship as defined by the law, collective agreements or practice in force in each member state. So this is for member states to define who is a worker, uh, which means that not only can there be uh, differences between states, between member states on who is covered, but also uh, that uh, the, the definition can be uh, restricted, uh, I mean, can, can limit the scope of European protection. So you find that in the two uh, directives of uh, 97 and 99, this, this absence of autonomous this definition of worker, uh, worker at EU level. And this, is, this, this situation is the same for directive um, 2008104, uh, uh, which concerns it, um, temporary agency workers. Uh, it says workers means any person who in the member state concerned is protected as a worker under national employment law. So this is the case for all these directives that national law is supposed to define, to define uh, the notion of worker. Now, uh, it would be a bit short to um, limit the analysis to this aspect and to the, uh, the letter of the directive, because uh, the Court of Justice uh, said something, uh, intervened uh, in this um, 
uh, context of no European definition of workers and no autonomous definition at EU level. And it intervened as it could, that is to say, in, you know, in the, within the legal framework, um, to say that um, it could not be the case that the scope of application of directives uh, is totally abandoned to member states. So uh, it, you know, it somehow tried to limit the restrictive approaches uh, that were sometimes followed by member states. The reason for that is that according to the court, there is a risk that member states' use of their discretion could jeopardize the objective of the directives. Um, and so for that reason, the court encroached a little bit upon states' power, uh, somehow violating the letter of the directives under which it was supposed to be uh, member states defining the notion of workers. Uh, the control that the court operates on the definitions, the national definitions of workers, uh, lead to, uh, led to the situ uh, a situation where the court said that, uh, first of all, member states cannot remove at will certain categories of persons from the protection uh, that is granted by the framework agreements on part-time work or fixed-term work. And the court had this uh, language in, in a series of cases, including for, for part-time work, the Aubryan case in 2012, and for fixed-term work, the same solution was um, adopted in a case called, for instance, Del Cerro Alonso, a case decided in 1997. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about these cases just uh, in a few minutes. Uh, concerning the directive on temporary agency work, uh, the same type of control was, uh, was um, um, elaborated by the Court of Justice. It said that the concept of worker under that directive could not be limited to persons falling within the scope of that uh, concept under national law, and in particular could not be limited to those who have a contract of employment with the temporary work agency. That would, the court, the court said, jeopardize the attainment of the objectives of the directive, and therefore undermine the effectiveness of that directive by inordinate, uh, inordinately and unjustifiably unjust restricting the scope of that directive. Those are the words used by the Court of Justice. And they were used in a, in a case uh, quite recent uh, called Betriebsrat der Hochlandsklinik, uh, a case decided in 2016. So uh, what happened uh, with this case law is the court um, worked out a compromise um, in order to both respect um, the fact, the idea that uh, there is no autonomous dis definition of worker, uh, precarious workers uh, protected at EU level, but it cannot be left uh, totally uh, to member states to decide who is covered. And um, the, the compromise uh, my, is, uh, is, the, is the following. Um, there is no uh, exclusive competence uh, for the Court of Justice to define the notion of work. That is uh, clear. But in order to ensure the effectiveness of the directives, um, the Court of Justice required national courts to take into account a, a series of principles and criteria to decide on the existence of a work relationship and to allow the directives to apply. The central notion in the reasoning of the Court of Justice is the requirement of uh, consistency in national legislation. And I will explain this through examples, illustrations. In the Oberian case, for instance, concerning a part-time worker, a part-time judge, the question was, can, uh, can part-time judges be 
uh, who are sorry can part-time churches who are remunerated on a daily fee paid basis who are not employed under a contract uh, or uh, have no employment relationship under national law uh, can these churches be excluded from the protection of the directive on part-time work in theory, the answer would be yes, they can, because the definition of who is covered uh, is not fixed at EU level. Uh, it's a definition at national level. But the Court of Justice said uh, something different. It said the, these judges can only be excluded from the protection of the directive if the relationship between them and the Ministry of Justice, they're, they're, uh, for whom they're working, let's say, uh, by its nature, is substantially different from that between employers and their employees falling according to national legislation within the category of workers. So here the court of saying consistency is required within national law itself. And this consistency limits the possibility of restrictive, restrictive interpretation uh, of the scope of application of the directives. So if if member states decide that in situation, like the situation of those judges, other persons would be covered and would be con because they would be considered employees uh, in the same circumstances, circumstances, work circumstances. Uh, if other persons would be covered, then the judges should be covered because they are in a situation of employment according to national legislation itself. Um, so that's the, that's the way for the Court of Justice to say something about who is covered by EU legislation without defining at EU level who are the workers covered. But, but uh, uh, putting some requirements inside uh, national law itself, requirement of consistency. Um, indeed, this case, this Aubrey case did, uh, deals with judges. So um one may think uh, it's not very useful uh, to um, you know this case is not very useful as it cannot really be uh, considered um, similar to the, the the situations that are more most problematic today particularly these the situation of uh, platform workers for instance but um the truth is even if this is a case concerning judges, so situation that are not comparable to the most problematic ones today, um, the reasoning applied by the court, this kind of uh, analogy that the court is making uh, between judges excluded at national level and other employees, this, this analogy can be um, used, uh, this is my impression, to uh, other categories of workers who would be excluded under national law uh, if the court had not um, imposed this kind of um, comparison and this requirement of consistency. So that's uh, the first illustration. The second il illustration uh, that is, uh, I think, interesting is the one uh, in the case Betriebsland, uh, Betriebsrat der Hochland, Hochland Klinik uh, of 2016. This is a case concerning a nurse who worked for an association of which she was a member, the German Red Cross, and uh, who did not have the status of worker under national law since she, she did not have a contract of employment with the association. Um, and the question was, can she be excluded from the concept of worker under Directive 2008-104? So can she be out of the protection of the temporary agency work directive? To this question, the court replied that member states or temporary work agencies are not allowed to exclude at their discretion certain categories of persons from the benefit of the protection, in particular from the application of the principle of equal treatment when the employment relationship between those persons and the temporary worker agency is not substantially different from the employment relationship between employees having the status of workers and a national law and their employer. So here again, it is a question of consistency within national legislation. Um, 
whenever a person is um, is comparing a similar uh, situation as a person that would be protected under national legislation, it should be protected. Um, the court uh, added that uh, the legal characterization under national law of the relationship, uh, the work relationship, uh, or the nature of their legal relationship or the form of that relationship. Here, there was no contract, uh, formal contract. All these elements um, are not decisive for the purpose of characterizing that a person is a worker under the directive. Uh, so according to this case, the concept of worker for the purpose of the directive covers any person who carries out work and who is protected on that basis in the member state concerned. The two criteria, uh, the court said, are not uh, within the power of national law. Uh, so you see, there is a way for the court to introduce a limit to the um, definition by member states of the personal scope of protection. Uh, and uh, that is important because that was not uh, obvious uh, to begin with, that the, the, there was something, some control uh, that the court could exercise um, on the definition of the scope of, of the protection granted by the directives. Um, now, there is um, also uh, a way uh, or um, uh, there is um, also um, a way or, or um, an evolution or an extension, <laughs> that's what I was looking for, uh, another type of extension that was um, worked out by the Court of Justice concerning the personal scope um, where uh, it has uh, proved to be important. It is inclusion of workers employed in the public sector. So in some member states, as, as France, for instance, um, when you think about pub the public sector, you think about civil servants uh, who are not particularly precarious uh, since they have um, uh, a lifelong employment. But the truth is that uh, even in member states like France, where uh, a number of persons employed in the public so, uh, sector are civil servants. Uh, there are many precarious workers in this public sector. And that's the case in France, but that's also the case in many other member states, including Spain and Italy, for instance. So um, the question has been, and it's not a recent one, um, um, it's been, it was a question already in the 90s and, and uh, continued to be a question throughout uh, the 2000s. Um, the question has been whether these persons were protected by the directives uh, concerning a, a typical employment. And the court uh, had no hesitation on that. Uh, it said that workers employed in the public sector are granted the protection of EU directives. They should benefit from these directives. Uh, this is... Um, very clearly explained in the case Adenella and others, the case decided in 2006. Um, the motives, the reasons for that uh, solution is that the provisions, according to the court, the provisions ensuring equal treatment that uh, are very central in the two directives uh, of 97 and 99 the provisions in ensuring equal treatment uh, must be applied extensively since there are rules according to the court uh, that are of particular importance. And um, the court says rules, this, this equal treatment rule uh, is so important that each employee should benefit uh, from this rule as a minimum protective requirement. Uh, that is something that is also um, explained in the case del Cerro Alonso that I already mentioned. Uh, so there is a, a, an inclusion of all these workers in the public sector that maybe um, 
you know, maybe it didn't seem so important when the, the directive was drafted, or maybe member states wanted to exclude some, some workers from the, the scope of the protection, but that did not resist the, the case law of the court. Another way the court uh, intervened uh, in order to limit this definition by member states, by member states and this um, control by member states of the scope, personal scope of the protection of the directive. Uh, another way was the, 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 uh, the intervention of the course on this notion of objective grounds to exclude categories of workers from uh, the protection of the directive of on fixed term contracts. Uh, in that directive, uh, it is um, under that directive, it is allowed uh, on the basis of so-called objective grounds for member states to introduce restrictions to the principle of equal treatment. Um, and the court said that these objective grounds could not be uh, left to uh, member states, to the discretionary, discretionary power of member states. The court exercised control about the use of the notion of uh, objective grounds to exclude protection. In particular, in a case called Land Tirol in 2010, the court said national law cannot, on the basis of a general abstract national norm, exclude workers employed under a fixed term contract of a maximum of six months, including workers employed on a casual basis with contracts limited, limited to one day from the scope of application of the directive on fixed term contracts. So it's not possible just to take, to adopt uh, legislation uh, at national level, just you know, saying that some, some short term contracts are not within the field of application of the directive. It's not possible to do that and, and say, there is an objective ground for excluding these workers. That's the law, that's the statute. That's not ac accepted. And the court says clearly that a general norm of exclusion does not suffice. It takes precise and concrete circumstances uh, characterizing a given activity and justifying exclusion uh, to consider that, that, that there are objective grounds uh, allowing restrictions to the principle of equal treatment. Another important thing is the court is applying a proportionality test when these objective grounds are invoked by member states to limit protection. And uh, this proportionality, uh, proportionality test means that um, the unequal treatment uh, must respond to a genuine need. It must be appropriate for achieving the objective pursued, and it must be necessary for that purpose. So the, the, the notion of necessary for the purpose um, to be attained is a very important one because uh, that's where the control can be applied, the control of the court, uh, court of justice in particular, a national court, uh, whether this was necessary, whether the exclusion was necessary. And indeed the control can be strict or can be uh, you know, very, very uh, limited. It will depend, but uh, it's not inexistent. There is a control over the, um, the necessity to exclude uh, the protection, to, to exclude some workers from the scope of the protection. Um, so that's another way uh, through which the Court of Justice is trying to limit the, the possibility that is granted by the directive for member states to, um, to define, and sometimes to define in restrictive ways, the scope of application of these directives. Um, so um, that was the first point I wanted to make, this uh, and the first remark, I think important one, that um, in principle, and that's the limit of the directives, the, uh, the notion of worker covered of, so the, the precarious workers covered uh, are defined by member states. Uh, so this is uh, what I wanted to show is, uh, this is problematic, but somehow the Court of Justice intervened to limit the margin of discretion of states. Now, uh, there is another important point is uh, 
that the directives themselves, and in particular, the directive on agency uh, workers of 2008, these directives include limitations to the personal scope of the protection. Uh, so, and so this is another, this is another story. Huh? This is not uh, the, the limitation of the personal scope of application is not due to the fact that member states are in charge of defining who is covered. It's, um, it's different is the fact that within the directive itself, there is a limitation uh, of, uh, of the protection. So I was saying the most important restriction, and I will come back to that uh, with, uh, with more details, the most important restrictions concern agency workers. There is one other uh, element uh, in the directives, but I would say more minor, uh, which is the fact that uh, are excluded non-standard contracts with a vocational or public work ele element. We're just point to that uh, rapidly and then move on to temporary agency workers. Uh, the exclusion concerning non-standard contracts with a vocational or public work element um, is found in the um, clause two of the agreement in fixed term contracts that says, member states um, can decide not to uh, apply the, the agreement on fixed term contracts to initial vocational training relationships and apprenticeship schemes. Also to employment contracts and relationships which have been concluded within the framework of a specific public or publicly supported training, integration and vocational retraining program. So, um, you know, this is, a, I, you know, what one would say rather limited, but still this is a possibility to exclude protection for some forms of uh, work relationships um, because they have um, either a vocational or a public work element. That's one restriction. It applies to uh, fixed term contracts. Also, um, uh, it applies to temporary agency work. Now, I would like to move to what I find more important is the, it's the limited limited protection of agency workers. The directive of 2008 indeed is less, uh, less protective than the other two, uh, the one on part-time work and the, work, the one on uh, fixed term work. Uh, and there is a list of, of um, uh, restrictions that I would like to, to point out. Um, and he here is the list. Uh, first, there is no protection against abuses. Uh, protection that is found in the directive on fixed term contract, but not in the directive on temporary work agencies. Um, second, there is an exclusion of workers assigned to a user for an, end, an indefinite time. Uh, third, there is a so-called Swedish derogation, which I will explain later. Fourth, there, is, there are derogations to equal treatment made possible by collective agreements. And uh, last, uh, there are problems with identifying the employer and the employer's uh, liability in the, the context of temporary agency work. So let's start with uh, the exclusion of agency work from the protection of the directive on fixed term contracts, which means abuses are not um, um, controlled uh, or limited. There was an attempt in a, in a case called De La Roca uh, to convince the court that um, um, the protection of the directive on fixed term contract could extend to uh, workers that are temporary agency workers. So there was a, a, a possibility uh, um, and uh, when the question went, uh, after, you know, was a possible interpretation of the field of application on the, of the directive on fixed term contracts to include those fixed term contracts that are um, accomplished by workers uh, working for temporary agency, agencies. But the, 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 when the court was asked this question and asked whether the extension could apply, it said no in De La Roca. It said that the protection of temporary workers against abuses cannot be ensured 
under the directive on fixed term contracts. And uh, it explained why uh, that uh, the reason is because a fixed term worker uh, in the directive on fixed term workers is a person having an employment contract or relationship entered into directly between an employer and a worker. Uh, so that cannot be uh, according to the court uh, agency work. So of course there is, you know, uh, the letter of the law, but the result of this uh, uh, this uh, application of the directive and restriction of the field of application of the directive on fixed term contract, uh, the consequence of that is that temporary agency workers are deprived of protection against the puces. Uh, because this protection is not in the directive of 2008, it's not included. So that's the first point. The second point is a second restriction that concerns um, agency workers is the fact that uh, those of these workers who are assigned to a user for an indefinite time are not covered. That's Article 1.1 of the directive of 2008. Uh, so when workers, whenever workers are assigned to a user for an indefinite time, they may be considered outside of the field of application of the directive. Um, not protected. Now the Swedish derogation. The Swedish derogation um, is, uh, <laughs> that's how Article 5.2 of the directive of 2008 is called. Um, and it says that uh, member states can exclude from the, benefit, from the benefit of equal treatment temporary agency workers who are permanently employed by the agency and who receive remuneration between assignments. So this is understandable uh, if you're thinking that the protection uh, of, pre of precarious workers is at stake. Uh, when protecting temporary agency workers. So if you consider that workers who are permanently employed by a temporary working agency are not precarious because they are of permanent employment, uh, it seems fair to have this provision, this so-called Swedish derogation. So you, you're, you're excluding from the scope of protection or protection that is supposed to uh, protect precarious workers those who are not supposed to be pre uh, precarious because they have permanent employment with the, uh, with the agency. But the problem is that in fact, uh, it is not really uh, the case that those who are employed permanently by uh, a temporary work agency are, uh, are not precarious. <laughs> In fact, uh, what the Swedish derogation allows is to pay less than the workers working permanently in the, in the users. Uh, those who are um, assigned by, um, by a temporary work agency. And because in some member states, it's very easy to dismiss those workers. Uh, in fact, they are very precarious, even if they have a permanent contract with the temporary work agency, because it can be dismissed at will in some member states. Uh, it, it makes it, it results. Uh, uh, the result of this situation is that some of the workers who should be protected because they are indeed precarious are not covered if member states wish, if they wish to do that. So this is a way, and that's been uh, observed, this Swedish derogation is a way to escape uh, the, the, the cost of equal treatment uh, for temporary workers. Uh, it's a way to circumvent the uh, European legislation to protect temporary workers and to avoid abuses. Uh, because if work temporary workers are paid the same as um, workers employed permanently by the user, then uh, this is a, this is a, a way to limit uh, the the recourse to these workers, precarious workers. So the Swedish re uh, derogation is indeed uh, quite problematic. Um, now the another aspect concerning temporary work, uh, temporary uh, agency workers, is the fact that the directive uh, at Article Five 
again allows uh, collective agreements, member states to um, uh, to decide that through collective agreements, derogations can be um, uh, agreed on um, concerning the protection of uh, temporary agency workers, uh, derogations to equal treatment. Um, so social partners indeed should be a rampart, uh, a rampart against uh, derogations, but if they are not, there are a risk there is a risk that uh, equal treatment is not granted to um, um, agency workers uh, under the directive. And um, uh, indeed, uh, this could be problematic for those workers in the gig economy um, because uh, there are very short contracts. Um, uh, and uh, if social partners decide to uh, uh, exclude the protection, uh, the equal treatment uh, rule, that in, in fact uh, <laughs> means that the, the, the objective of the directive is, uh, is going to be um, a completely, um, um, I mean, the directive is going to be completely uh, inefficient. Now, again, uh, remember the, the collective um, agreements, the need for a collective agreement should be a barrier to such an evolution. Um, but um, this uh, this is you know this is a question because uh, not only is uh, Article five three allowing social partners to decide or member states to allow <laughs> social partners to decide that equal treatment is not applicable to some um, some categories of workers, um, but also when there is. Um, no system for declare, uh, declaring collective uh, agreement uh, universally applicable or for extending the protection, the provisions uh, to all similar undertakings in a certain sector, member states themselves uh, are allowed to, to take arrangements concerning the basic working and employment conditions of temporary agency workers uh, derogating from the principle of equal treatment. The only thing they have to do is to consult social partners at national level. Um, uh, and uh, make sure that they, they have an agreement and then this can be extended to, to the, whole, um, the whole sector. So um, this is also a, a problematic uh, aspect of the directive on temporary, um, temporary work temporary worker agencies. Um, the last point I wanted to make is about the problem in the, in the same directive on the identification of the employer and employer's liability. Uh, the, um, the thing is that uh, the directive achieved something very important, which is the recognition of temporary work agencies as employers. But um, the problem that remains is the distribution of responsibilities between the, the notional employer, the agency, according to the directive, and the free one, uh, concretely, the user. And that uh, is not uh, established, the way liabilities is um, distributed among them. Uh, when compared, you know, this is, a, this is interesting to compare with the directive uh, of uh, 91 on uh, safety and health at work of temporary workers, because that directive makes it clear that the user undertaking is responsible for the duration of the assignment for the condition go governing the performance of work. So for these particular aspects covered by the directive of 1991, it is clear that the user undertaking has some liability. But for the rest, uh, this, is not, um, this is not clarified. And this is not clarified in particular by the directive of 2008. So all kinds of problems uh, under directive uh, of 2008. Um, that I think uh, is, uh, can be explained because um, <clears throat> the um, uh, what is at stake 
with temporary agency work is not only the protection of uh, precarious workers, but it's also um, the existence and development of a particular sector of the industry, which is temporary uh, work. And um, that explains that um, it was very hard to obtain a substantial protection for the workers concerned at European level. Uh, because uh, you know the compromise was made between the, um, uh, the protection of the economic interests of the sector and the protection of the workers concerned. Uh, now I would like to um, continue, continue with pointing at the evolutions uh, deriving from the reactive 2019-11-52 because this is uh, the, the very recent, very interesting development and of course, we cannot say much about how the provisions of that directive will be interpreted. Uh, there's nothing in terms of interpretation for the moment, uh, from what I know, and that's normal because the directive will only, will only be uh, implemented by 2002 as uh, the requirement. So for the moment, uh, it's hard to find a way to use the directive before the Court of Justice. It could be used <clears throat> as a reference persuasive argument maybe, but really uh, nothing, um, nothing will uh, really happen in terms of interpretation before um, some time. Uh, so um, we don't have much uh, in terms of the interpretation of the directive, what exactly is going to be covered by this directive. But what we know is what the directive already contains. And that's a, a step forward, I would say. So, um, to go back a little bit on uh, the emergence of this directive, it is worth knowing that it was uh, adopted recently, uh, soon after the European Pillar of Social Rights was proclaimed in 2016. So it is one of the directives um, that is uh, supposed to be delivering, as the European Commission says, on the European Pillar of Social Rights, which is a program uh, to relaunch social Europe. And the goal of this directive is to address insufficient protection for workers in the most precarious jobs, as I was saying in the beginning. Uh, the truth is that uh, the achievement uh, of the directive is uh, quite impressive because there is in the directive a number of important new rights for precarious workers. And I will say um, a little bit more on that just in just a minute. The limit, again, is the personal scope uh, of the directive, the notion of work. But let's start with the right. First, a right to information. Uh, that is uh, what the directive was initially about, to increase the right of, uh, to information for workers, um, a right that existed since uh, 1991 uh, with a directive that was adopted then. But that right um, needed to be um, updated, particularly to take into account the situation of precarious workers. So the right to information is, uh, has been um, developed. Um, workers have a right to a more complete information on the essential aspect of the work. And also they have a right to receive this information early on when employment begins. Uh, for most, for the largest part of this information, it has to be given to the worker in the first seven days of work, uh, which is uh, an improvement indeed uh, as compared to what was required in the directive of 1991. Um, what is particularly important, I think, for precarious workers is what is mentioned in Article 42M of the, uh, the new directive. It says, if the work pattern is entirely or mostly unpredictable, the employer shall inform the worker of the principle that the work schedule is variable, the number of guaranteed pay, paid hours and the remuneration for work performed in addition to those guaranteed hours. Second, the reference hours and days within which the worker may be required to work. And third, the minimum notice period to which the worker is, is entitled before the start of the work assignment uh, 
and where applicable, the, dead, the deadline for cancellation. So important information for precarious workers. This is interesting as it relies on an idea of protection through information, a bit like for consumers uh, and consumer contracts. The protection uh, is not necessarily substantial, but is based on information at the beginning of the contract, which may allow workers uh, to refuse um, or at least they know where they're going uh, when contracting for these uh, precarious jobs. So this is a very important evolution. Another very important article in the directive is Article 10 on so-called minimum predictability of work. Um, uh, and this, it looks a little <laughs> technical um, when uh, at first glance, but the idea is uh, to give, uh, to um, introduce conditions for uh, workers uh, whose work pattern is entirely or mostly unpredictable, um, conditions under which uh, they are required to work for an employer. Uh, these conditions are the two following conditions. The work takes place within predetermined references, reference hours and days, first, and second, the worker is informed by his or her employer of a work assignment within a reasonable notice period established in accordance with national law, collective agreements or practice. So uh, information, again, um, on the, the pattern of work for, for those uh, who uh, would be in a situation where they don't really know um, what their work is going to be um, under this particular uh, work, uh, work, uh, work arrangement. Um, if these requirements are not re uh, fulfilled, this type of information not given, then the uh, worker, the directive says, have a right to refuse the work assignment. And they should be able to do that without uh, Article 10 2 says, without adverse consequences. And then um, the third point, the third point of Article 10 says that uh, workers should be entitled to compensation if the employer cancels the, um, the work, uh, the assignment, after a, spe a specified reasonable deadline uh, when there was an agreement with the worker on an assignment. So protection in case cancellation takes place uh, where this is not uh, done within a reasonable uh, deadline. Another important article under the new directive is the, the prevention, the article concerning the prevention of abuses that concerns on-demand contracts. Uh, I was saying before that that's one important aspect of the new directive that it concerns the particularly uh, the most precarious um, of the precarious contracts. And that's uh, these uh, among these, there are these so-called on-demand contracts. And uh, Article 11 of the directive uh, deals with these contracts by uh, trying to cope with the, the risk of abuse of these contracts. And so, the, the article, uh, the article, the provisions of the directive in, indicate that uh, member states must introduce measures to to prevent abusive practices. Either either of these ones, uh, limitation to the use and duration of these contracts, or a rebutable presumption of the existence of an employment contract with a minimum amount of paid hours based on the average hours worked during a given period. That's a way to limit abuses. And the, the last possibility is to find something equivalent to that. And that's, that's very close, this, this, this provision is very close to what was already um, in the directive on fixed term contracts. You know, the, this, this uh, ways to avoid abuses uh, of fixed term contracts, but now it applies and it's a, it's a little, you know, with slight modifications to uh, on-demand contracts. 
which is a, a different situation. Um, so um, um, I would say this Article 11 is particularly important uh, and will be particularly important in the future. Uh, it will, of course, very much depend uh, on the interpretation of these, uh, of these provisions um, and that we will see in the case law of the court. Um, the directive also introduces um, something that I find is um, um, to be taken very seriously. It's uh, the measures to um, enforce uh, the new rights. And there are two types of measures in the directive, the so-called legal presumptions and the early settlement mechanism. So um, the first method is to introduce presumption that if the worker has not received information, the information he, he or she is entitled to, uh, then he must benefit from favorable presumptions defined by the member state. So this is one way uh, to make sure that the right to information considered very important for precarious workers, but the right to information is uh, applied, is respected by, by employers. If there is no information, then a favorable presumption applies. And the second, um, the second way to ensure, to ensure enforcement of this, uh, this new rights, and particularly the right to, to information, is the early settlement mechanism, that is to say, workers must have the possibility to submit a complaint to an authority or a body and receive adequate redress in a timely and effective manner. So here the idea is, uh, it's not going to be the classical court system, action in courts, which costs money, uh, is long, takes, uh, takes long, um, is difficult, uh, access is difficult particularly for the most precarious workers. So here there should be the idea that there should be something more efficient, but more accessible uh, for workers to effectively obtain redress. So I think this is uh, worth uh, keeping in mind because this is a way um, through which the, the formal rights become concrete. And that is going to be something to, I think, uh, um, control actively, you know, from a European point of view, make sure that member states uh, actually implement these provisions. Uh, there is also at Article 16 the right to redress, um, meaning that uh, the, the classical system of dispute resolution uh, exists, should exist, uh, and, and that these precarious workers should have access uh, in case their, their rights um, are not respected. And uh, so that uh, the uh, actions uh, in court uh, are efficient, uh, there is also a system in the directive to ensure uh, that there is um, um, a shift in the burden of proof. Uh, and that I think is a very interesting provision of the, um, the directive. When worker, and we know this from, from particularly the directive on discrimination, this, this shifting of the burden of proof. When workers establish uh, facts from which it may pre be presumed that they, there has been a dismissal uh, that is based on the fact that they exercise their rights under the directive, it is for the employer to prove that the dismissal was based on grounds other than those prohibited. So this is a way to um, make sure that it's only necessary for the worker to make a prima facie case of dismissal because he tried to exercise his rights under the directive. And once there are sufficient facts, sufficient elements, then the burden of the proof shifts to the employer. And this is a mechanism that we know about without waiting long uh, for interpretations of this provision by the, by the Court of Justice because this mechanism exists, as I was saying, for uh, this, the directives on discrimination. 
Okay, I think I will leave the penalties aside because this is quite classical. Uh, and uh, just say a few words about the remaining problem in this new directive, although it is, I think, a uh, source of many interesting achievements. Uh, there is still this problem with the limited personal scope of application. Uh, this uh, moves us back to Article 1 of this, uh, this directive, this directive of 2019. It applies to all workers, indeed, uh, in all forms of work, including those in the most flexible, non-standard and uh, non-standard uh, arrangements. Um, it, it includes, as I was saying, zero hour contracts, casual work, domestic work, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the commission is, is saying on, on its website, but the definition of workers, it's a national definition. So we find, we, you know, we're back to the, the same, um, uh, language that we find in the previous directive that um, uh, workers are defined by national law or collective agreements of national practice. Uh, except for one part uh, of this uh, of the, uh, the, the this provision of the, the directive of 2019 that says um, with consideration to the case law of the Court of Justice. This is new. So in the national definition, consideration should be taken to the case law of the Court of Justice that defines workers. And probably that refers to the case law developed under the other directives on a typical work. So maybe that's a way to say, but we'll, say, we'll see that, uh, that member states have a limited discretion, although it is for them to define the notion of workers protected under the national legislation there is limited discretion because consideration has to be taken, taken to the case law of the Court of Justice, considering the notion of uh, considering uh, the notion of work. Um, but in addition to that, uh, so you know, no again, no autonomous definition of the notion of worker. Um, the directive allows the exclusion of the very precarious workers. It says that you know, there is a possib possibility for member states to exclude workers whose working time is equal to or less than an average of three hours per week in a reference period of four consecutive weeks. So when it's really, really short um, periods of work, uh, workers can be excluded by member states. Now, um, this is not um, without limits because the directive says that um, uh, this exclusion is not possible when uh, employment relationship uh, are such that they do not guarantee an amount of paid work uh, that is uh, predetermined before the employment starts. So in fact, this, this uh, articulation of these two, two, two paragraphs uh, means that uh, you know, the exclusion of very uh, workers who work very, very short periods of time is only possible when they have a predetermination in their contract of a guaranteed amount of paid work. And if it's not the case, then there's no derogation. So maybe all in all, it's not, uh, it's not so exclusive of the most precarious, this directive. Another uh, exclusion still is about uh, domestic workers. Uh, possibility to exclude from, from some of the right, not all of the right, uh, the workers employed by nat natural persons in households, when these persons are acting as a, uh, uh, for these households. Um, this is also a way to suit some of the, the precarious, um, the, the, the workers employed uh, by households uh, can be in, in very precarious situations um, that we know from all the work done about domestic workers and uh, domestic, the domestic workers are not uh, the issue in this uh, directive, they're not the ones uh, considered in this uh, directive of 2019, that's probably for uh, another, uh, another type of regulation. Uh, so I would like to conclude on the directive uh, to say that uh, it's a great achievement, and I've said that before, uh, in terms of new rights, new information in particular, uh, and the fact that it covers its, its horizontal in a way, it's not selecting or segmenting uh, the categories of the typical workers which are protected. 
But again, uh, in this directive, the definition of worker is left to national laws. Uh, and so that makes the, uh, the limitation of uh, the personal sco or scope of the directive possible. Also, um, the directive only deals with um, employees, workers. Uh, it's not covering self-employment. Uh, it's not covering independent workers. And that is also problematic because among the precarious workers, they are indeed uh, independent uh, or self-employed workers. More and more, it's more and more the case uh, in the gig economy. So the fact that the directive is only covering employees, workers, uh, meaning those having an employment contract is also an important limit. So now the last, um, the last part that I announced on, on perspectives, it's a way, in a way it's a conclusion. Uh, I, I'm thinking about different types of perspective. One is, uh, and maybe it's, uh, it's not so central now because uh, maybe the COVID crisis changed things in terms of uh, social Europe. Uh, but that was the case a couple of years ago that, uh, um, you know, the, the feeling was the evolution would be towards more flexibilization, even more flexibilization, uh, due to the fact that uh, the economic and monetary union, the, the instruments of this e economic and monetary union were pushing in the direction of more flexible contracts, um, and that states were encouraged. Uh, in the economic and monetary union to develop more flexible work arrangements rather than limiting them. So, you know, somehow a conflict between social Europe on the one hand and on the other hand, demands and requirements very strongly put on member states to flexibilize uh, the labor markets that um, was very, uh, very difficult. Uh, to you know, um, to do without <laughs> either violating uh, social directives uh, or uh, calling them in question. Well, something uh, as a tension here, and maybe uh, the economic and monetary union was going to be stronger, more powerful than the requirements of the directives on uh, a typical work, and was a, and that was a very uh, very important concern. Now maybe this is a little bit on the side not as central as it was before. And I guess the, the COVID crisis has, uh, has a role to play. And probably also the fact that there is a new uh, European Commission um, and uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, oriented exactly in the same uh, way as the, the former one. It's, it's probably um, concerned that uh, social Europe is more, um, is taken more seriously even than the former Commission. Um, now, uh, another perspective, uh, and you know, it's uh, completely uh, the opposite perspective, is uh, that we can uh, hope maybe that in the future, uh, fundamental rights, fundamental social rights in particular, those um, stemming from the Charter of Fundamental Rights, in particular, the social provisions of the Charter, and I'm thinking uh, namely uh, about Article 31 of the Charter on Fair and Just Working Conditions, mm -hmm. These um, provisions of the Charter and more generally social fundamental rights could help um, grant more protection to precarious workers through more extensive interpretations of the directives. And we'll see that may be at play with the interpretation of the directive of 2019, if it is interpreted in relation with social fundamental rights, maybe uh, it can be more inclusive and protect uh, in better ways precarious workers. And then, of course, we can think about new legislation in this field. Uh, the truth is, since we have the Directive of 2019, it's harder to think uh, that there will be uh, further developments uh, and more legislation in the near future. But there are possibilities, and I'm thinking in particular uh, about the fact that the Commission is uh, launching a number of studies about platform workers, and uh, that that, that um, leaves open the possibility of new legislation specifically for those platform workers. Uh, I'm thinking this uh, could be the case uh, that uh, uh, something uh, is developed, some new legislation uh, emerges about platform workers. Now we would be back to um, 
segmentation in the protection if that happened. You know that a particular category of, of precarious workers is is uh, dealt with with a specific instrument, mm -hmm. and it's not something horizontal uh, covering all types of precarious workers. Um, and whether this is a good uh, good solution or not, uh, I won't discuss now. Uh, but I think it is uh, it is something to think about uh, for the future. So I will leave it open for now and um, finish this um, presentation by thanking you very much for listening to it. <laughs>